coming. In 2018, the world became really concerned about AI ethics. And that wasn't because suddenly, across borders, across sectors, we became enlightened. It's because by now we had enough big scale scandals hitting very close home. And this is just a few, there are many more. So we realized that data is power, that social media is not just fun, that democracies around the world are under threat, that tech companies routinely collaborate with law enforcement and militaries in ways that the public does not realize and in ways that are not necessarily fair, and that algorithms may reinforce discrimination and even amplify it. So, in parallel to these scandals, and as a response to these scandals, more and more institutions started to um, focus on AI ethics. So, academic centers are established, these are again just a few of them, to focus on AI ethics. Uh, laws are being written, tech companies started to put together ethics boards and ethics teams, and AI principles are put forth. Many AI principles are put forth. So ranging from as few as just five principles to as many as 30 plus, tech companies, professional organizations, political entities put forth various sets of AI principles. The last one of such documents was by AI for People. Um, this was also the basis uh, for the draft ethics guidelines of European Commission's high-level expert group on AI. And it argued that all those 40 plus principles can really be summarized under just five principles. And they can really be summarized under just four. And these are respect for autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So for those who have been working on applied ethics, these principles are no strangers. They are the traditional bioethics principles. And it seems like both the companies and the regulators are now moving towards an ethical governance of AI in a model that puts together principles with ethics boards fueled by the scandals and backed up by the law. Again, we've seen this model before. This is the traditional research ethics model put forth 40 years ago. And the problem with this model is that principles, be it 4 or 40, um, just summarize important ethical concerns, but they, are not, they don't solve conflicts among themselves, among each other. So let's say you're developing an AI tool to, for, as a, a diagnostic tool for healthcare, and it requires you to access large sets of personal data. If you are going to uphold the principle of autonomy, you need to get consent from each and every uh, person who is going to share the data with you, and for what reason. So they need to understand why they are sharing their, sharing their data with you. But that would, of course, take time, so it will slow the development. And those people who are in need right now, waiting for this tool to come out, um, whose lives may be saved, will be um, lacking this benefit. They will be harmed by the delay. So here you have the conflict between the autonomy and do good, do no harm type of principles. And if you are just sticking to the principles, there is no hierarchy. There is no way of solving this, this um, conflict. So any, um, any board that only relies on principles will not be able to get guidance that takes them through the hard questions. They will inevitably be get lost. And this is what we've seen in the last 40 years in research ethics. And most importantly, this is a model for ethics policing. It is gatekeeping model. It is an ethics as a tag on model. What we should have instead is to develop an ethics model for AI where ethics completes and enhances technology by, in, by being an integral part of the research and development process. So we cannot do this with vague principles or ethics boards that show up in the beginning of research and at the end of research and never again. We really need to need an approach that's comprehensive and integrated. So here I will present um, in three steps how companies will be companies or research centers can integrate ethics into their research and development. And let me first explain this in abstract, and then I will uh, illustrate it with an example as well. So first, we need researchers and developers to recognize ethical problems as they work through a project. To do that, they need to understand the main ethical concerns, how, they, um, how these concerns fit together, and how they feature in practical application as they work on the technology development. And here it's really important to understand that when we are talking about ethics, we are talking about an analytic, structured, systematic reasoning. It's a, um, 
we need to train researchers and developers to engage in this structured thinking when they are dealing with ethics questions. So to make researchers and developers familiar with ethical ideas, we at the AI Ethics Lab, we develop, uh, we design training, and training sessions and modules. We also produce and use sector-specific use cases to bring those ethical ideas down to application. And we design workshops in various levels to have the participants, um, the developers, learn and get familiar with the stru this structured thinking, this ethical reasoning. Um, so detecting the ethical problems is not enough unless you're just going to overlook them or you're going to abandon any project as soon as you see an ethical issue. We really need to solve them. In fact, we want to catch the, these problems early on as they arise and tackle them in real time at each stage of the innovation, starting from the research phase all the way to design, development, uh, manufacturing, and even updating of the technology. And we definitely want to do this before more resources are spent, before ethical problems become full-blown issues or, and even scandals. So the goal here is to avoid unethical outcomes, but also to enhance technology, to make technology beneficial. Again, to do this, we need to first analyze the ethical issues around the technology that the company or the research center is working on. But that's not enough, so we need to include ethics analysis in the product development. So we need to integrate it into the whole innovation process within the each specific projects. So this requires ethics and ethicists to be the part of the process and part of the uh, project team. Whether they are full-time employees or they are consultants, they need to be in the team. Um, and you can think of this sort of like a design approach rather than this policing approach. We are really trying to solve the ethics questions here. And once you have the ethicists together with the engineers um, working as a team, then you also have the benefit of having them learn from each other and really improve their understanding of both technology and ethics. And finally, there will be hard questions that the company needs to take a stand on. Do you work with the military? Do you work with oppressive, undemocratic countries? Um, if a research is harmful, do you still publish it? This was the recent question that OpenAI faced with. So you need the, the, et you need the ethicists and ethics teams to set up frameworks, a policy that allows the researchers and developers to know what to expect about the recurrent hard questions. And also, um, and many ethics questions will have more than one right answer, which is okay. This plurality is okay, but it should not fall into inconsistency. So now let me explain how this structure will work uh, with an example. So let's think about an AI system that is designed to provide coaching for a healthy life. So we worked, we recently collaborated with per Berkman Klein Center and Petroflom Center here at Harvard University, and uh, we produced a research agenda for designing AI health coaches. So me and my colleague, we, we, were, uh, we provided the ethics part of this. So now imagine this technology as a variable. So it could be um, a watch or a t-shirt, and it keeps tracking your physical activity for 24 seven. And in addition to that, to understand your lifestyle, your mental health, it also needs to access other platforms. So it communicates with your social media, um, your Alexa, Google Home. So it collects all the data that it needs in order to really track your lifestyle. And it also asks you questions about your preferences, your goals, um, your values. And analyzing all this information um, it gathers, it provides you with guidance uh, on how to reach your goals and tries to keep you on track. So that's the technology. Now, does such a tool would be really cool because why? Um, unlike the traditional healthcare, you would actually have um, all the relevant information, true information, because we love lying to our doctors and our coaches. Um, it will be analyzed in real time, and as soon as something goes wrong, it can alert you to it, and it, you will be able to make informed decisions because you will have all the information ready. So that's great, but of course, developing such a tool will uh, raise a lot of ethical issues. So first of all, you're dealing with extremely intimate data. And this data is not just interesting for you, but it's also interesting for other parties, like the insurance companies or the employers. And they don't necessarily have your best interest in mind, let's put it that way. 
And if the goal is to effectively guide you to your, if the, the tool aims to effectively guide you to your set goals, like make your behavior change, then we are probably going to require some manipulative guidance as well, like nudges, because we know our motivational problems. The tool can keep telling you that you should exercise, but it's not going to work. So it's probably have to manipulate you in some ways. So when you are, when the developers are designing this such a tool, it's just important that they are, they can recognize and flag ethical issues. So we said an intimate data. So it's important that they can um, look around the privacy concerns for the, about these intimate data. Also, for example, the training data. We are talking about health a healthcare product, a healthcare tool. So it's very important that your training data was balanced in terms of gender or race so you don't end up having high error rates for certain groups of the, who are going to use your technology. But as I said earlier, you know, just uh, recognizing problems is not enough. We really need to solve them because we don't want valuable products to fail. So for that, now we need to incorporate the ethical decision-making reasoning as we develop this product. For example, how is the consent procedure will work? How, do, does the, how should we design the consent so that the user understands what, what, what she or he is giving, as well as understands what is given to him? So what kind of uh, advice is being provided? All the limitations of this advice as well. How do you balance different well-being concerns? Um, there will be times where there will be tension between the individual preference and the public health. How do you deal with this problem? And how do you use nudges in such a way that both balances the individual um, decision making and also helps them overcome so certain motivational problems? So all of these are um, questions that needs to be analyzed along the way. And there will be also hard questions, so coming to the policy side, there will be also hard questions that the company will need to take a stand on. For example, are you going to make this tool, are you going to collaborate and make this tool available to oppressive governments or aggressive businesses where you understand that they, will, they are likely not to um, respect the privacy of the user and likely to use the information against the user. So the important thing to recognize here is that these are not lofty ethical musings. We are talking about actionable ethics decisions that require real-time problem solving during the research and development process. And these are questions that are discussed for decades, if not for hundreds of years, in ethics already. So you will hear experts in their, in their own fields come together to discuss AI ethics, and they will start pondering about, but what does ethics mean? Like, what do we mean by ethics? The good news is you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. The ethics is already an entire field with its knowledge, skills, tools distilled over two millennia. So we can use this body of knowledge and expand it, of course, as well, to, and use it to solve today's problems. So these three steps can be implemented um, in, within the company or within the environment where the companies develop. So obviously, larger companies will have more resources, but even startups can take advantage of this if these steps are implemented in the incubators or the research and development centers. So going back to my earlier point, can this be done through ethics principles and ethics boards only? It cannot be done because, as I said, we can principles help us start thinking. Boards are great for the policy making. But I'm talking about mundane, day-to-day -day decisions, ethical decisions that needs to be done so that we move to the next stage as we are developing a product. That requires ethics to be a part of the, uh, part of the discussion and part of the everyday routine. Um, it's not a yes or no stamp like the research ethics uh, model. So, and let me end by saying, in the absence of a successful integration of ethics, the tech world is basically risking to share the same faith as the biomedical research and be ruled by ethics boards that really delay the research and not necessarily uphold the ethics while doing so. So businesses really need to take the responsibility for ethics in their own hands and also by doing so give some time to the regulators to develop good regulations rather than rush to respond scandals that are, that are happening. Mm -hmm.